You were intimately involved with this case at the Supreme Court. Tell us about it. We're there because we support Trinity Western's rights. We felt very strongly that no one in Canada should be punished for their religious beliefs. And that includes upholding a traditional belief in marriage. We we're also very concerned about the larger precedent. This wasn't just about Trinity. This case was really about freedom and that a society that cannot accommodate and admit of difference is not truly a free and democratic society. We need um, people to take note of this decision. What does this mean for Christian education across the board? Where, do, where does this end? We'd be naive to think that this decision won't impact the work of like-minded organizations. That's the big unknown. That's the big unknown. Can we accommodate religious difference? Or does everybody have to believe what the state believes? Such an interesting time. Welcome to the show. Freedom isn't free. These are weighty words, both for those who have fought for freedom and for those of us who enjoy freedoms that we never had to pay for. After our men and women in uniform, perhaps few know the cost of freedom in Canada right now, more than those who have been at the forefront of Trinity Western's fight for a nationally accredited law school. Recently, that fight went all the way to the Supreme Court after a several year journey through provincial courts. On June 15th, 2018, in a split 7-2 decision, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that Trinity did not have the right to graduate law students. This, not because of the academic proficiency of the university, but because of Trinity's community covenant in which students agree to restrict sexual activity to monogamous heterosexual marriage while studying there. This verdict was in stark contrast to a 2001 ruling in a similar Supreme Court case regarding the university's teaching department. The most recent ruling is a sure sign that things have shifted in Canada in regards to religious freedom. The challenge for religious freedom does not end with Trinity Western University, however. It has also been rearing its head in public schools, in summer jobs grant funding, in corporate Canada, in federal pol political parties, excuse me, and even parliamentary committees. For a nation that prides itself in inclusivity, the lack of tolerance for some faith perspectives is perplexing. All of this is happening while thousands are gaining refugee status into Canada because of religious persecution in their native lands. Their hope is to live in a nation that is free, but is it? Well, in studio today to talk about this important issue that affects so many of us is Derek Ross. Derek Ross is the executive director and general legal counsel of Christian Legal Fellowship. His focus is on human rights and religious freedoms, and he has appeared before the Supreme Court on multiple occasions, including in defense of Trinity Western. I know his insight on this important topic of freedom in Canada is going to be invaluable. I'm looking forward to introducing him to you, so let's get to it. Christian Legal Fellowship is Canada's national association of Christian lawyers, law students, professors, and judges. CLF's mission is a simple but profound one, to keep the door open for the gospel in Canada. We seek to work with others to defend the fundamental rights and freedoms of all Canadians, freedom to worship freely and freedom to speak and pursue truth. The CLF is the voice of our generation. It is the voice of truth. It is the voice of justice. It is one of the few voices that is consistently speaking the, the truth of Jesus Christ to our nation, to our leaders, and to Canadians. They are going and they are sometimes fighting the Goliaths as we sit in the pew wondering, why is the government doing these things? They're taking our voice and they are making representation for us. And they're doing a great job. Um, it's also really important to know that there are all these other people all around Canada working together in their different areas. CLF is involved in a lot of issues that are quite literally the future of our country. It's things that as Canadians we should be very concerned about. And so if these things aren't protected, uh, our country is going to go in a very different direction than we want it to. CLF has now grown to over 700 members. We want you to be part of it. Let's get the message out there so the church is informed and equipped and understands what's happening in Canada. So share our posts on social media, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter. Will you support us? Consider making a donation to our work. It allows us to continue to fight the good fight to advance rights and freedoms for all Canadians. 
Keep us in prayer as we advance the work of justice. We've been doing it for 40 years. With your support, we hope to continue to do it for years to come. We're just getting started. Hey, Derek. 18. Thanks for thanks for braving the 407. Oh, th thanks so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you here. Great you to be here. are the executive director of the Christian Legal Fellowship. First of all, thank you on behalf of the faith community for your important work, and uh, and you're also a general legal counsel yourself, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Well, how long have you been in this role, in this position? So I've been with CLF for three years. I've been practicing law for ten years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when I tell people that I'm, I work with a, an organization of Christian lawyers, the reaction I often get is that's an and oxymoron. it's a non-profit. It's a non-profit. A lawyer, like, and, and people it's are like, like, what, you went to law school to work with that? Yeah, well, they, they give me that reaction too, yeah. Um, but the, uh, you know, the one that I often get is that's like a lawyer joke, right? Like Christianity and law and they don't mix. But, you know, from our perspective, we believe very strongly mm -hmm. that we need faithful men and women in the legal profession. Mm -hmm. And especially in cases that we'll be talking about today, mm -hmm. you know, it's so important that we have people there that can represent faith communities in a way that the broader culture and the broader public and especially legal decision makers can really understand. Mm -hmm. And so is that the heart of why you chose this direction rather than practicing law in a private way? I think that's part of it. I, I think a lot of it too is uh, when I became a dad, I started thinking about my kids and the next generation and um, thinking about what kind of country are our kids going to grow up in? Um, how free will they be to pursue their faith? Whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, just lit a fire in me uh, and a passion for religious freedom. Wow. And I know that that's not just me. We have um, a membership of, a, of about 700 lawyers who are all very passionate about these issues. For the sake of the next generation. Absolutely. Powerful. Now, one of the reasons that we have you in studio today is we want to talk about the recent Supreme Court Trinity Western ruling regarding the law school. And so right now, what I want to do is I want to watch a clip from the House of Commons with you. This is several members of Parliament who made statements regarding the case before it went to the Supreme Court. And then uh, 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 some voices, national voices, articulating regarding the verdict, and then we'll talk about the implications, if that's okay. Sounds good. Okay, let's watch this. Mr. Speaker, freedom of religion is a value that Canadians hold dear. Sadly, there are some people, businesses, and even law societies that are opposing this value. Citing Trinity Western University Student Code of Conduct, they say that either Trinity should not be allowed to have a law school or that Trinity graduates should not be allowed to practice law. I call on all opponents, Mr. Speaker, of Trinity Western University's future law school to withdraw their opposition and support the important Canadian value of freedom of religion. Canadians were shocked to hear that the Law Societies of Ontario and Nova Scotia voted not to certify Trinity's law graduates for practice in their province. The reason isn't because of Trinity's highly respected academic standards, no. These law societies voted against Trinity because they didn't like Trinity's Christian code of conduct for students that chose to attend. This is a dangerous attack on religious freedoms in Canada and it affects all of us. Canada is a country known for human rights and religious freedom. The intolerance demonstrated by these law societies tarnishes Canada's international rep reputation, making it hypocritical for, for Canada to speak out internationally when our own religious freedoms are under attack from within. In 1981, Canada enacted the Charter of Rights, which guarantees religious freedoms in strong terms. It means you cannot deny a job to a qualified applicant because you don't agree with their religious beliefs, as the Ontario Law Society recently did to graduates of Trinity Western University. Okay. If a lawyer passes the bar exam and has had a thorough legal education, it is beyond belief that they would be excluded from legal practice because of the religious beliefs here, here. of their school about marriage. If anti-religious ideologues have led the Ontario Law Society to adopt such an extreme discriminatory measure, it's time for progressive-minded rights advocates to speak out loudly. Such tyranny never stops with a single victim. This isn't just a Trinity Western issue, not just a law society issue. It isn't even just a Christian minority issue. It is an issue for anyone who advocates for freedom from tyranny. 
The Supreme Court of Canada has ruled on whether Trinity Western University's proposed law school should be accredited. While the court had strong language affirming individual religious freedom and its expression, in a split decision, the majority ruled that the law society's decision not to accredit the law school is a reasonable decision, given the facts of the case. This is a long and complicated decision of over 250 pages with four separate opinions. It will take time to understand its implications. It is a sad day. How we as Christians respond matters. It is part of our witness. This is a blow, but we are people of faithfulness and hope. Please pray for Trinity Western University as I digest the implications of this decision. And please pray that we will all manifest Christ's light and life in our response. What it's saying in losing this case is that you are not allowed to bring those Christian views that training in a Christian setting is going to prejudice your practice of law. It's actually the first case I know of where we're actually hearing that Canadians will not tolerate Christianity in a very important part of the normal ebb and flow of Canadian life. Wow. Potent words. Canadians will not tolerate Christianity when you and I both know that, you know, scriptures are all over the foundation of this nation, all over the Parliament of Canada. Wow, a lot to digest there. Um, so you were intimately involved with this case at the Supreme Court. Tell us about it. Yes, well, I was one of the lawyers for Christian Legal Fellowship, and uh, we intervened as a friend of the court. So we're a third-party, independent organization that's there bringing our legal expertise um, to help the court understand some of the nuances of the case. So basically, you just got to make commentary on the case. Exactly. So you weren't necessarily defending anyone or speaking for anyone, just speaking to. Precisely. And of course, we're there because we support Trinity Western's rights. Mm -hmm. um, but Trinity Western has their own lawyers. And I want to say there were a lot of uh, really uh, wonderful lawyers that were involved in this case, all advocating for freedom of religion. I was just one of them, and I was humbled to be part of that team. Um, but for us, the reason we got involved was we felt very strongly that no one in Canada should be punished for their religious beliefs. And that includes upholding a traditional belief in marriage. And we were concerned that that's what was happening here, and we're still concerned that that's what's happening here. We we're also very concerned about the larger precedent that this case would set, that this wasn't just about Trinity, as you heard in some of the clips we just watched, that this would have an impact on all people of faith in Canada and how government actors could treat faith communities when those faith communities held beliefs that were different from the state's approved views. Um, so we saw that as being a very wetter, watershed uh, moment in our, in our jurisprudence. Really, the case at the end of the day was about how free we are to live at our faith in the public square. And a lot of the lower courts understood this. Before we got to the Supreme Court, this was litigated in three provinces in six lower courts. And I think the, the British Columbia Court of Appeal said it best. They said that uh, this case was really about freedom and that a society that cannot accommodate and admit of difference is not truly a free and democratic society. Hmm. One in which citizens are free to think, to debate, to dialogue, to disagree with the accepted view without reprisal. Um, now, I, can I, if I could introduce yeah. something, I think people who are in support of the Supreme Court decision would say, listen, nobody's uh, saying that you can't practice your Christian faith personally, but basically what they're saying is that uh, an institution can't uh, require people who participate in that institution to believe a certain thing. Um, is that accurate? And do you have any commentary on that? That's absolutely what some of the counter arguments were in this case. And in fact, even the Supreme Court hinted at that to say, you know, nothing in this decision prevents people from holding these beliefs and adhering to them. Um, but where it became a problem was when people tried to do that in community. Mm -hmm. And mm. my response to that is, what is religion? What is faith but a place where people can come together in community and not be forced into isolation in living out their faith and living out their beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, our Supreme Court up till now has always had a very strong, robust understanding of freedom of religion. They have always said that it protects your right to express your beliefs, not just privately and not just individually, but publicly mm -hmm. and in community with others. And in fact, international human rights instruments protect that as a fundamental part of our freedom as well. Mm. So to say that your freedom of religion is limited to what you can sort of believe personally in the privacy of your own home or within the walls of your church is a very narrow 
and I would say very impoverished understanding of religion. So I want to ask a real direct question here. So what does this mean for Christian education across the board? If you can't have a Christian law school, does that mean that you can't have a Christian high school or a Christian elementary school or you can't be a Christian who homeschools? Where, do, where does this end? Well, strictly speaking, the good news is that this decision very clearly applies only to Trinity Western's law school. The court made that very clear that the facts, the decision does not apply outside of the limited context of Trinity Western's law school. But is it precedent setting? That is the, that is the bigger question and the bigger concern. Um, we are, you know, from our perspective, this case has to be looked at within the realm of the very specific facts. We had a law society with a unique statutory mandate. That was the focus of the court's decision. Um, so in future cases, absolutely a judge could distinguish this case from other cases, and in our view, should, because of you know, the, the way that the Supreme Court handled this issue, we think needs, needs to be handled differently by future judges. So that's the good news, that this is limited, and the court went out of its way in several occasions to say, this is a limited scope a decision. Having said that, hmm. we'd be naive to think that this decision won't impact the work of like-minded organizations moving forward. So that's so the potential implication. That is the potential that's implication. That's the big unknown. That's the big unknown. Mm. And so absolutely, we need um, people to take note of this decision. Uh, pastors, uh, faith leaders, Christian organizations, all organizations of minority faith communities, I think should be troubled by this decision. Mm -hmm. Because what at the end of the day, the court recognized that what the law societies were doing in rejecting a law degree from Trinity Western, the majority acknowledged that that violated freedom of religion. But they said that violation was justified because it promoted the values of equality and diversity. Mm -hmm. So that is the big problem is now we're saying that certain values, which really vary from judge to judge, mm -hmm. could effectively trump our constitutional rights, which are very clearly spelled out in the Constitution. Right, and we now have this situation because of the construct of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms where judges are having to decide which group rights uh, trump others, right? Because here you have sexual rights that went head to head with Christian or religious freedom and they had to make a decision of which was on top, which is a, a really interesting dynamic for a nation to have to be in where we're actually against each other instead of all working together towards a common goal. So we're gonna go to a clip right now, but in a moment I wanna come back and talk to you not just about Trinity Western, but whether or not we're seeing this in other realms of Canadian society as well. But we'll talk about that right after this. You can save lives in just 15 minutes a week. Prayer is powerful. It reaches where hands and feet can't. It breaks chains. It opens eyes. It opens doors. It can set people free. Through the Justice Wall, you can be a part of a prayer chain interceding 24-7 for the ending of abortion, ending of human trafficking, and for the persecuted church. You can save lives through prayer. Only 15 minutes a week. Join the Justice Wall today. Find out more at justicewall.com. Through The Fate Teen Show, we're tackling issues influencing our nation's future, like freedom of conscience, racism, poverty, the debt, human trafficking, abortion, democracy, and much more. If you missed a show, you can watch anytime at fateen.tv or on YouTube. We hope to see you there. Okay, Derek Ross, Christian Legal Fellowship of Canada. We're talking about freedom of religion in Canada. Now, the Trinity Western case, very high profile case, but it's not the only scenario where we're seeing religious freedom under fire in Canada right now. Can you give us some of your observations of, of other areas where we're seeing a dynamic at play? Absolutely. We, we are seeing, I think, increasingly uh, government actors are becoming less and less willing to accommodate traditional Christian beliefs, uh, particularly in public spaces. So uh, one example is the um, challenges that are being experienced by uh, men and women in the medical profession. Mm, okay. um, so there in Ontario, uh, physicians are required now to participate in procedures that they have a conscientious objection to, like abortion and euthanasia, by providing what are called effective referrals. So what that means is if a physician is unwilling to perform that act themselves, they have to be prepared and they have to take positive steps to find someone else, another physician who is willing and available and able to perform it and refer the patient to that 
available doctor. So for a, a Christian physician, for example, that would view some of these procedures as uh, harmful or unethical or not in the best interest of their patient, they would still feel very complicit in facilitating this for their patient. Absolutely. And uh, so we've been involved in a constitutional challenge to that requirement. It's the only province in Canada that requires it. Now that's at a lower court right now, right? Do you see that one going to the Supreme Court as well? I think it, it's quite likely that it will. It has been heard by a lower court. The lower court acknowledged that this policy violates freedom of religion, but they held that it was justified. Again, another violation that's justified. Uh, in their another group rights dynamic. Well, that's the argument, is that this is needed in order to ensure access for patients to get to these services. But the court at the same time acknowledged that there was no direct evidence to suggest that conscientious objectors we're impeding access. Patients can still receive these services through uh, telehealth, for example. And uh, other provinces have established phone lines that patients can still get these services. So why are we forcing physicians to participate? Is it really about access? Mm. Or is it because there's a push to silence mm. any voice of dissent in the medical profession that would suggest these procedures are unethical. Now, how is this affecting Christian doctors? Are people starting to resign? Are doctors starting to resign? Are there nurses, medical professionals? How are they responding to this? I, I have heard of at least one physician that chose to resign as a result of this uh, instance. Um, others are awaiting the outcome of this decision. So right. that uh, decision has been appealed to right. the next level. Right. Uh, and that will be heard by the Ontario Court of Appeal probably within the next year. But to be forced to do something against your conscience that just feels so un-Canadian. It does. It, it really does. It really, really strikes at the core of what it means to be a free and democratic society. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're forcing people to do that, which they think is fundamentally wrong. Are we seeing this anywhere else? So another example that, uh, a case that we're also directly involved in is the Canada Summer Jobs litigation. So that's a federal grants program that provides funding to private employers to hire summer students, uh, including faith-based organizations. Um, this year, for the first time, the federal government introduced an attestation requirement. So in order to receive the funding, you have to check a box saying that you agree with certain values spelled out by the government, and one of them is reproductive rights, which the government has said refers specifically to abortion. Mm -hmm. So if you're not willing to check this box and say that your core mandate respects mm -hmm. abortion, mm -hmm. you can be denied funding even though you're otherwise eligible for it. We were. Right. There we go. <laughs> so there's just one example, and there's an example of where one's religious beliefs um, are preventing them from being equal participants in society. So that's another case that's currently being litigated. Wow. And we see, you know, with all these cases, there's some common themes. Mm -hmm. And the common theme is, can we accommodate religious difference, or does everybody have to believe what the state believes. Such an interesting time. So how are you counseling people to respond to this dynamic nationally right now? Well, there's the legal answer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that is, of course, you know, for those organizations that are navigating the legal implications of this, we do encourage them to connect with a lawyer. We have a referral uh, network uh, on our website. What is your website, by the it's way? It's www.christianlegalfellowship.org. Great. Um, but there's there's also the, the philosophical reaction. How do we respond? Respond as Christians and uh, I think we do need to respond but we need to do so prayerfully and thoughtfully um, there's some impulses that I think we have to resist one is for some people they might look at these decisions look at where we're at culturally and just want to bury their heads in the sand and retreat from public discourse and retreat from public engagement and say we're losing the culture the culture is lost and just not worry about what's happening outside of the walls of their church. And I think that is the worst thing mm -hmm. we can do. It's not the time to pull out. We can't retreat <laughs> from, from serving our culture. We're called to be salt and light. That's We're good. called to seek the welfare of our nation. Mm -hmm. And we do that by participating in these mm -hmm. public institutions. Mm -hmm. On the other extreme are those that would say, if our beliefs are putting us at odds with culture, let's just jettison those beliefs. Let's find a way to water them down or change them or write them out of our doctrine because we don't want to offend anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a problematic response as well. Yes, we do need to critically examine our theology. We need to ask with a posture of humility some hard questions. Why do we believe what we believe? Why are these beliefs really important to us? Mm -hmm. have, we, have we really discerned what is true mm -hmm. in the way that we approach these issues? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, 
and we can have some internal dialogue about that and, and some debate, but that's for the church to have mm -hmm. internally. Mm -hmm. It's not for the state to force us mm -hmm. as faith communities mm -hmm. to change our beliefs. But once we land there, we need to be prepared to have the courage and the integrity to stand up for those beliefs and not water it down. To be present. To be present and to articulate it in a way though that reflects both grace and truth. And love. We, right. we can't have Amen. one without the other, right? Amen. As you're speaking, and our time's coming to a close here, but as you're speaking, I'm reminded of a, a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, who actually said to us years ago, he said, you know, one of the reasons that Canada has been great is because people of faith have been willing to be involved in her shaping and her making, and Canada will continue to be great as people of faith continue to engage. And I think, you know, Christians are Canadians too. Absolutely. <laughs> it's all over our history, and uh, we need to continue to do our best, as you said, to serve our nation in love. So, Derek, thank you so much for being with us today. Any final words for the nation right now? Well, just to pray for our nation. Mm -hmm. We need to pray for Canada. We need to pray for our leaders, and that includes judges mm -hmm. um, who have a very difficult job. And as much as we critique these decisions, we also have to recognize the immense pressure they're under. And we're called to pray for them, that God will bless them and give them wisdom. Powerful. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, God bless you, and thank you for your work. God bless you, too. <laughs>